So, um, okay, what I hope I can do today is to finish uh, this uh, presentation of the I method with uh, essentially um, everything that we need to do. After that, it's going to be some computations that I won't really necessarily do for you. And then look at the modified scattering on R. And I will probably only have time to comment on what changes when you want to go from R to R cross T2, which um, makes your equation more like a system in some sense. Um, but, OK. And so these are, I've just put on the board, uh, stuff that we have seen last time. Uh, so the Fraunhofer formula, and then what we essentially could obtain um, before was that we had a robust uh, local theory for the cubic NLS on our space in every HS space as bigger than one half. And the one thing that I uh, would like you to remember is that it was robust in the sense that really didn't depend too much on the nonlinearity, depended on the dispersion relation to get uh, strict arts estimate and bilinear strict arts estimate, and essentially the fact that we had three copies, we had a cubic nonlinearity. And uh, the last thing that we saw last time was uh, the formal computation of what happens uh, if you look at the energy not of your solution, but of some modification of your solution. And it was this formula, and we observed that in some cases you can get a lot of consolation there. And so if I sum it up, we, the situation for the moment for the cubic NLS on our space is that we have a robust perturbative theory on HS with S bigger than one half. And essentially what it says is that whenever you are in spaces smoother than H one half, the higher frequencies, they are going to be so small that they won't really matter and you believe that nothing is going to change too much when you go, uh, when you look at very high frequencies, provided you're in this space. And the second um, thing that we would like to use is the fact that there is a non-perturbative uh, ingredient, which is the uh, conservation of energy, but unfortunately it's only available in H1. And so we expect things to be fairly stable in H1. And it's non-perturbative in the sense that here it does matter uh, what the exact structure of the nonlinearity is. And if there was some bars here or there, then this would not uh, work as well. OK, so we would like to use this and the question is um, knowing that whenever uh, you go to, uh, if you're in HS when S is uh, bigger than one half, high frequencies don't matter too much, then you can hope that you can push the non-perturbative non method a little bit further and uh, at the end of the day this is what we're going to uh, prove that indeed you can do it uh, at least for S bigger than 5 over 6. And so what you want to do is to <laughs> change your unknown to get something where you can use the stability. And so you, and uh, so then the question is how would you choose that so that at least you start with something in H1 and then you can use uh, those things in H1. And so the, and uh, conversely what kind of so now, if you were able to control well this unknown, what kind of control would that give you for uh, your solution U? And so the trivial uh, choice to pass from a solution in HS to a solution in H1 would be to uh, smooth it by uh, taking S1 minus, uh, S minus 1 derivative of it. And so in this case, if you were able to control V, it would tell you that you would have to be essentially below the envelope that would be like C to the uh, 1 minus S. And that the Fourier support should be some, somewhere there. 
But what we have seen is that, um, well, this is too simple of a change of unknown, and in this case, we would uh, change too much uh, the equation. We would not really be able to get good use of uh, the conservation law. And instead, the idea was to take some multiplier, which is going to be one or constant for large frequency. And then at some point, it has to match the remainder because you're only starting with some solution in HS. And so uh, instead of, so our i will be one over this thing. Um, so something which is a constant for large frequency. And now you get a new parameter, capital N, which tells you uh, for which until when you're going to uh, uh, not make uh, the distinction between your solution, the fact that, it was that you're measuring it in H1 or that and that it was in HS, and wherever you start controlling the tail. And so if you choose this as your multiplier, then essentially the information that you hope to get is that your solution is going to be below this envelope for uh, hopefully large time. And so then the, 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 the game is that you have this parameter n, and as you take it larger, <coughs> you expect your solution to, uh, uh, the, the lower piece of it to be more and more stable. So the larger you take n, the, um, the longer the time you hope to uh, be able to propagate this information. Unfortunately, the poorer the control you have on your solution. And so this is something that I think is worth noticing, noticing because um, this gives you a mechanism whereby you get global existence on your solution because we're going to take n larger and larger to get control on our poorer and poorer control on our solution on longer and longer time scale. But in this case, we won't be able to bound any norm which is scale invariant, which is something a little surprising, knowing that at the end of the day you do get a uh, uniform in uh, or a global in time information. And this, this is going to be something very different whenever we go to modified scattering where we really need to understand the asymptotic behavior of the solution and there the crux is going to be able to get a uniform bound on a scale invariant norm. So, okay, once uh, these remarks are made, then the mechanism for the, and once we have chosen the multiplier, which we saw last time, uh, after that, the, the proof itself is just a combination of two propositions. Uh, okay, let me write them and then, uh, and then just uh, comment on them. Uh, but maybe before, let's just observe that what we're going to do is just work with this new unknown V. And so what is the equation satisfied by V? It starts in the same, so it's a, a linear operator, so there we, we don't change anything. And so this is a priori a little uh, surprise or a little scary because remember that i minus 1 is something like that, so it's uh, essentially some positive derivative, one minus s derivative. So, well, you see that, at least if you're in the, the counter example for uh, the scaling um, uh, estimate, so if all of those guys are at the same frequency, which is very big, you smooth it out by uh, one time, but then you derive it three times, so you're really worse. Of. But of course, what saves you is that now what you've gained is that you're in H1, which is uh, a case where the cubic nonlinearity is not really going to be, um, uh, well, you're much smoother than the, the, the H1 half that you sh would need for cubic nonlinearity. Um, now, still, okay, so this tells you that so long as you're in regularity bigger than H1 half, then you would expect this, counter, this scenario to not be too bad, but uh, there is one scenario which uh, 
is usually the one that uh, is the worst case in, say, quasi-linear problem, is if you have only one big frequency and then all of the others are small, but uh, so that you don't uh, get too much advantage of them. But then you see that if you have only one big frequency, then you derive it once, but you integrate it once. So you're more or less essentially in the same situation as uh, where you were if there was no eyes. Okay, and so once this is done, then uh, so we're going to see so proof of theorem follows from two And so the first one tells you that this is a nice equation, and if your solutions are in H1, then um, you can uh, propagate this. Uh, I mean, they will behave nicely, and they will behave just as free solutions, at least for some uh, interval of time. So, and for this, uh, it's important that you're higher than one half, but then uh, the moment you're one higher than one half, it's good. And just to make, let's give us a little bit of room here. And let's start with an initial data in H1. And what we want is to say that it propagates at least, uh, well, somehow that we're looking at a solution that is more or less in this part. So we want to make sure that our solution is not too big and then uh, try to see on how long of a time interval can we control it. And so if n large enough, uh, and t is or maybe one plus Well, no, I guess it's homogeneous, so... Um, then there exists a unique solution of this equation here, which has the correct initial data, and which remains in this space so that I can think of it as essentially a linear solution. So the norm in the correct space would be of the same size as the size of the initial data. Yeah. So here, the only important information are the fact that uh, given, so long as we keep some control on the size of our solution, then we can get uh, some uniform interval of time where we can essentially think of our solution as a linear solution. And what do we gain from this? We gain that we have access to all of those bilinear uh, estimates. Um, because as we have seen, to be able to use those bilinear estimates, we have to, we have to know that our solution behaves like a uh, free solution. So otherwise, it's a complicated, um, uh, not linear constraint on the space. OK, and then the second solution, the second proposition, Ah, and one last thing. This proof is now really the same thing as the one that we did for the equation without the eyes, and you just go through the same proof, and uh, so you do exactly as we did. So you uh, localize each of them in dyadic frequencies, and then once you localize each of them in dyadic frequencies, you know exactly this is either going to be one or some number, and then you just uh, look at the sum. So this is why I, I wanted to insist that what we had was a robust perturbative theory in HS because it goes through for those kind of uh, modification of the equation. And the second proposition is saying that, well, if we can think, um, so long as we have good control on our solution, then we'll have good control on uh, the increment of the energy and it's going to be relatively small. So, I'll give you the statement, and then we'll see why it implies the theorem. Uh, and after that, the proof of the statement is really going through this formula, and then uh, keep keeping in mind the cancellations that we had, and then after that, estimating everything. 
uh, in a fairly naive way. So we want to be able to think of our solution as uh, as a linear solution. So we want to be in the setting of the previous proposition. And then in this case, so long as we're looking at an interval which is sufficiently small, then we can estimate those terms and get some bound which is of this form. So now what does that say? So long as you can uh, force this to be small, it tells you that the difference of the energy at the final time and at the initial time is some small number times the energy at the initial time. So that it's really, the energy has not really changed. Uh, again, how do you prove that? Well, you just use these formulas, this formula there, and then you control all of the terms. And one last comment is that the moment you have that, then you've won. Because what you're going to do is to iterate this um, sufficiently many times. Why? Because this tells you that your energy did not really grow. Your energy did not really grow. Uh, so in particular, it's going to remain uh, smaller than, say, E of IU at 0. Uh, probably this is not true, but smaller than, say, the upper bound that you had for the initial data for uh, after, even after p iteration. Because once you've done one iteration, then you've really changed it by, say, 1 over 100. And then you can continue to do it until uh, you get uh, to two things that are comparable. But so long as you can do it, um, so long as you can iterate, it gives you the right um, assumption here so that you will be able to do it for the next interval of time. And so uh, now you just have to keep your, uh, to ask yourself how many times will I manage to iterate it uh, until I reach that. And it's essentially one over this number here. And so, if you choose n large enough, then you can observe that uh, this is the square root of that. So this is really uh, the, the bigger one. And so how many times will you be able to iterate it? Well, essentially, n to the s minus 1 half. And now, OK, so you can do it for p interval of time of size capital T. On, uh, P times capital T, which is going to be n s minus one half times the size of the interval of time, n minus two one minus s minus delta, and uh, this should give you exactly the five, uh, the six s minus five, because it's what it's. Uh, so you have three s minus um, five halves and then some remainder. And so you see that uh, this, if you choose s bigger than 5 over 6, this is something positive. And so by taking n larger and larger, you get a control on your solution on longer and longer time interval. And so there is, and after that, to capture the growth of the norm, well, you just uh, undo this, this uh, relation between t and n. OK, so. Um, yeah, basically that's it. And those two propositions, they are really just turning the crank uh, using those, uh, what we had seen before. So I think that's it for the I method. Um, but again, I wanted to stress the fact that, that I find surprising that uh, it's a way that gives you global 
control on your solution, even without having any uniform control on the scale invariant norm. But of course, the price to pay is that you have no information at all about the global, uh, the asymptotic behavior of your solutions. So now, let me switch to, I think it was three, uh, a completely different part. And I, let's see if I can link the two parts later. And this is modified scattering. For the cubic analysis on R. And so I'm going to show you some downgrade of uh, a proof of Cato and Pusser theory. But as I've told you before, there are a lot of variants of that. Um, uh, so you can choose the one that you prefer. However, I would say that for the moment, we understand pretty well what happens for small data on some topology, which is whatever works. But uh, there trying to understand what happens when you take larger data is something extremely complicated and I don't think we have a good understanding, at least if you want to go to very long time. And so uh, I think if you want to try to uh, go in this direction, so one of the things that you want to do is to improve on the topology, the control that you need. And so there was, I think if you want to try uh, scale invariant spaces, the best result that I know is, I think it's a master thesis of Xiaoming Guo. And, uh, but it's also related, although it's not exactly the same equation, but it's very related to work by uh, Professor Vega, oh, Banika, and Luis Vega, which essentially tells you that it's going to be very difficult to go to global existence large data. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you don't understand that, uh, well, you're we're going to be very much limited. Okay, so now let's uh, get there. And maybe before we get into uh, the actual computation, let's get a heuristic proof of it, which is going to be take us four lines. And then after that, the bulk of the work is to try to make sense of that. And the simple proof that we can get is if we assume that the Fraunhofer formula was exact. So imagine that the free evolution of your function is exactly given by the stationary phase term. So heuristic uh, assuming So if you remember, um, we had seen, or it's direct to see that uh, the cubic analysis can be rewritten in this form. And so now we're going to change variable and go to what is more stable, which I will call B of t. And this is what uh, and we're going to work most of the time on this. And so the, the advantage is that uh, at the linear level, V is completely conserved. So the uh, time variation of V is completely um, nonlinear. So in particular, you see that you've already won because if V was of size epsilon, DT of V is going to be of size epsilon squared times the size of V. Uh, and what is this? It is e to the i t d x x, e to the minus i t d x x v, e to the i t d x minus i t d x x v, e to the minus i t d x x v. All right. And now let's use the fact that we have an 
well, we assume an explicit formula for this. So this becomes e to the i t dx x. And now this becomes e to the i x squared over 4 t over 4 pi i t to the 1 half times v hat of minus x over 2 t. And then we have to take three copies of that. So e to the minus e to the i x squared over 4 t over 4 pi i t to the 1 half v hat of minus x over 2 t bar and then to the i x squared over 4 t 4 pi i t to the 1 half v hat of minus x over 2 t. Okay, and in front we have this that uh, well we'll have to hope cancel somehow. Um, but now you see what happens, and here you see that the exact form of the nonlinearity is very important, which is that if you remember, we discussed that maybe the main term in all of this uh, in this formula is really this oscillating phase. But now it comes once like this and once with a bar. So those two are going to cancel. And so, and in fact, this is really the main cancellation because when, uh, so let me put those two together and then the only thing that happens is that I can pull out uh, one over four pi t. And then I have e to the i t dx x. And I do still have one phase, e to the i x squared over 4 t divided by 4 pi i t to the 1 half. And now I have those uh, v hat of minus x over 2 t squared v hat of minus x over 2 t. And that's it. And now what do I remark? Well. This is really just the frown of her formula again, but not for v, for something just a little different from, from v. And so I have 1 over 4 pi t e to the i t dx x times e to the minus i t dx x capital V, where capital V hat in c is little v hat in c squared v hat. And so, and now I can cancel that, and that gives me uh, a simple ODE for V. So, IBTV is equal to 1 over 4 pi T capital V, or maybe in the Fourier space it's a little easier. V hat v hat. And now, uh, well, you see several things. First, that if you were to go to higher dimensions, then you would have an, expo an exponent here bigger than one half. And so at, at the end of the day, would, you would have a factor here bigger than one. And so essentially, no matter what this is, it's an ODE that you could integrate brutally in time. But if you're in dimension one, you get exactly uh, 1 over t, and this is not something you can brutally integrate in time. In fact, if you write, uh, so I'm not going to get it right, I think, yeah. Um, if you just uh, change the time this way, you can forget about this factor, and you see that this is, uh, you have to understand this ODE. Now, this ODE appeared already in the talk by uh, Professor Carl, and um, he pointed out that this is a little scary a priori because it's a nonlinear ODE, but in fact, no, it's a linear ODE. Uh, the moment you realize that um, that this guy is in fact independent of time. So if it's independent of time, then you can replace it by a constant, and now you can integrate it explicitly. Um, and so you can integrate, and you see that uh, v should be equal to e to the i t 
e to the i log t times v squared v. And then uh, from there, you can pass to u if you really want it. And so e to the i log t u not squared unit. And so this is why it's called modified scattering, because at the level of u, what happens is that you really have a strong linear, which is uh, a, a strong dynamic, which is linear in T, but you have to correct it with with biodynamic, which is on a much uh, longer time scale. Yet, uh, uh, if you don't do it, then uh, after a very large time, your soli your solution is completely off. And essentially, that is the proof. Now, after that, the only thing is to really uh, make sure that you can control the remainder between the Fraunhofer formula and uh, the exact solution there. And um, so it's made easier by the fact that uh, in Wendy it's really explicit and so then you have to uh, deal with that. Now uh, maybe let me just make one comment here uh, before we get to the proof is that what happens on R cross T2 we'll see that you can at least get some similar heuristics. But of course, the main problem is that you're going to end up here with a system, which is this time a, full, a truly nonlinear system. It's the resonant system that um, Professor Chesi talked about. And so then, to uh, so something that you cannot integrate explicitly, and uh, what will be the main problem for us is something that has, uh, so, so that has few conservation laws that are not so strong. Okay. So, any question about this? So, if not, let's try to make sense of this and to make this rigorous. And so, to make this rigorous, that essentially means finding the right norm in which you, we can really uh, close a fixed uh, or a bootstrap control on the norm. Now the question is what should be the right controller? What should be the norms that we want to choose? And so I'll give you the full control that we can get and then we can discuss, uh, we'll discuss a little bit. So, or maybe I'll give you the, the main statement. If you start with an initial data, which is small in this sense, then there exists a unique global solution with u. And so, well, we can for free at the H1 norm, this is just the conservation of the energy, it won't help us. Uh, but it can help you get started. Um, now, let's see. The next term norm is also not so, it's going to end, end up being not so important, but it's uh, well known that it's uh, an, uh, important as an intermediate thing to control. And then we have the two important pieces. So essentially, these are the kind of control that we need. So this, as I've said, is not going to be too important. This is something that is uh, usual to uh, get some intermediate control. And I think we'll see easily, well, uh, actually, it's easy to see why it should be important, because what we want to control is modulus of u squared u. And so if we get good control on this, we would get good control on modulus of u squared. And then after that, it's uh, the potential that goes in front of u. Um, that we want to control this is something that you could have guessed from the beginning because we want to make sense of the Fraunhofer formula or more generally we want to uh, say that we can extract the main term in the stationary phase analysis 
And this is possible if you have some smoothness of the amplitude. Uh, and so this is really telling you that there is some smoothness of the amplitude, but in a way that gets worse and worse over time. And this is maybe the surprising and not surprising bit. It's the fact that if you really want to uh, control your solution for large time, then you really do need to have some control on a norm that is, well, at least I would say or, uh, you need to have control on a norm that is scale invariant. And you don't have that many choices uh, for norms that are scale invariant because uh, the scaling, as we have seen, it was uh, d over 2 minus 1, so for hs. So it would be h to the minus 1 half here. And so now this is a pretty bad space. Um, you could have hoped that you, you would get by with x to the one half times v in L2. But in fact, this is going to be defeated just by uh, the fact that uh, this is the solution that you expect. And you see that any time you take any derivative in C, you're going to get a log t that is going to pop up. So now, I mean, maybe you could still, this is something that is clear for one derivative. Maybe you could hope that one half derivative would not work. Uh, but um, that I, I would, I mean, at least it has to be complicated. And now this is one norm which is at the right scaling. And at the very least, you see that it's a conservation law. Uh, it's a conserved quantity for your limit equation. In fact, it, is, it was the crux of the argument for uh, this guy being well controlled over time. OK, so all right, so now let's, let's try to do it. And so the question is, what, how are you going to get a uniform control on this? And it's going, it will have to go from some, of some, from some form of Grunewald inequality, but we have to put in one non-perturbative ingredient somewhere. And so, um, so let's first observe that this one is for free. Let's just forget about this. And uh, let's, um, well, not um, care. I mean, let's see what we would really want to have. On V hat in H1 to make sense of the, uh, of the, okay, let me call the norm that we would like to control is going to be this strong norm. And what we would really want is to have uh, the hat in H1 and then everything else, let's say V in H1 and then V hat in, well, I guess, that's it. And if we had uniform control on this, uh, we would in particular control the L1 norm uh, of, uh, well, we would, if we had control on H1, we would have control on L infinity. And um, so now this is an L2 norm. So the reasonable way to try to control it is via uh, energy inequality. So. And via energy inequality, which means essentially you take your operator, you eat it with your equation, it goes on the nonlinearity, it's going to come to one of the u and the other one you put them in L infinity. You could really hope to get, can get, and in fact you can get, it's fairly easy, that you control dt or maybe dtvs is smaller than something like that. Let me maybe not be too precise here. But what you can get is something like this. U L infinity squared, if you're a little careful, times V S. So the only place where you have to be a little careful is, are you going to get V 
in a lin or v hat in l infinity, which would be bad because this is not going to give you anything, or u in l infinity, which you expect to decay. Now, <laughs> um, well, if so, this you can get, and now the first reasonable uh, thing to do would be to replace this by uh, using uh, the fact that if you're controlling, uh, well, by the decay of that. And if you were to do that, you would get 1 plus t times v in hs cube. This is what you would get if you only try to control this kind of norm. But now you see that the problem is that this kind of ground value inequality would only give you long time uh, control, but uh, it's an OD that blows up because uh, again, you can uh, do a change of variable to uh, take out this one over t, and then you have dtf e uh, is smaller than f cube. It's not going to let you get to global control. So you have to improve a bit on that. And uh, the question is, where can you improve? So there are several things that you could hope, and uh, to some extent, this is what you have to use for uh, R cross T2. You could hope that you could do a normal form transformation to move your equation from a cubic equation to a quintic equation. Um, so this you can do in R cross T2, and it's something that uh, gets rid of some of the terms. But in the 1D case, it, it would not really help you too much to do that, uh, essentially because the nonlinearity is so simple and so resonant that it's there. So if you cannot do a, um, a normal form transformation, what you could hope is that somehow um, you would not really need to uh, control by the... Um, so somehow that you can get better control on this than just the one that I had there. And this is what happens. But now the question is, how do you get better control on the L-infinity norm than just assuming that uh, you're in the S norm? Well, you have to look at the term in the Fraunhofer formula. And if you look at this, it tells you that control of this guy is really almost the same as controlling this term uniformly. And so this can give you the idea of trying to uh, add a control on the absolute value of the amplitude of v hat. And so if we get that, then, so, um, so no uniform bound. We need to replace this formal Granval. By, well, the first step in this case, we can't really improve it, so still going to be there. The advantage is that this is so robust that it probably doesn't depend too much on what we put in S, so long as it's something that is controlled by L2 norms. And then we will try to do better than that, better than. Uh, what we had before, and what we can do is to introduce a weak norm. So let's, which is going to be this one, which at this stage is really non negotiable because if we cannot get this one to be uniformly bounded, then uh, we probably have to give up on this scheme altogether. So but if we can hope to get this one uniformly bounded, then we can hope to have something like this. And, well, there is one more thing that we can always uh, hope, uh, that we can always put for free, so let me do it this way. I don't have to care about time between 0 and 1. Um, up. And now I will have... Um, so this by itself probably is not enough, but what I can hope is that uh, okay. So I wanted to make
And so, okay, but now I have a new quantity to control, so I need to uh, get something and I need to hope for something better. And what we'll show is that, and this is where the non-perturbative uh, ingredient comes in, it's to say that we get to control this thing, but we can cancel the main term there. And so now, the whole point is that these two ground value inequality allow you to uh, get uh, uniform control on the weak norm and get a control on the S norm that is going to grow uh, very slowly in time. So consistent with, or if we can prove this inequality, then we can propagate. And uh, in fact, probably to the epsilon squared. And the point is that even though this one is going to grow, it's always going to be uh, against one thing that has some fixed decay, so that this is still going to be integrable in time here and there. Times epsilon. OK? So now the point is just to uh, try to get those two inequalities. And maybe I'll try to now make uh, something about what happens in R cross T2. In R cross T2, remember, we want to control uh, a chess norm with S bigger than one half. And now the problem is that the L infinity norm is not even bounded at initial time. So, well, <laughs> So that means that uh, if you want to do that, you need to be better here and to put some other norm that uh, does remain bounded. And the norm that remains bounded is whatever you can control for the, ascent for the, the resonance system, the asymptotic behavior. And so there is some uh, extra work that goes there. Um, okay. And so now we can start the real proof. And uh, how much time do I have? OK, so at least we can uh, do it. Uh, so there are two things that are important to notice there. One is that in this scheme, the L infinity norm was absent. Let's make sure that we can easily, uh, that we get uh, this right control here. And the second is uh, what is the cancellation that happens that allows us to have this better estimate. So, and again, the H1 norm is conserved, say, through the energy. Let's just not uh, uh, talk about it. So, so, uh, so we want to control this. smaller than this quantity. Uh, so what is it? The weak norm plus, and I guess we get this. So that uh, I'll get the right control that I want before. So uh, first, contr first remark is that uh, it suffices to look at time bigger than one, because otherwise I just use the conservation of the energy. And now for time bigger than one, I'll just use the Fraunhofer formula plus the re with the remainder. So the first term now doesn't really, is not really so important because this is directly OK. And the only question is, what about the second term? So again, there is the phase, which I'm just going to take absolute values everywhere. So 
And now there is again a phase here. And now, well, it's clear what I want to do. I want to say that uh, either this, uh, either y is small and then I gain from that, or y is big, and then I gain from the fact that uh, my norm control uh, forces uh, v to be small for large y. So the only thing I'm going to do is decompose this into, and when is the smallness that I want to get? Well, when y squared is comparable to t, so. I'll decompose this. And there, when y is big, then I just use the fact that all of this is bounded by, say, 2. And when y is small, this is bounded by 1. This is bounded by y squared over t times v. And uh, there was a 1 over root t in front. Well, and now you can just uh, integrate it. So, uh, so in this case, I can just put a y here and divide it by 1 over root t. And I think that's enough. Uh, a y and no. I need something that is integrable. And then I do Cauchy-Schwarz on both sides, and I get uh, this estimate. So, well, this uh, shows you. I mean, this really shows you that the crux to get the proper decay is really to control the weak norm. And then after that, we don't necessarily care too much about the stronger norm. Now, to control the weak norm is more complicated. But not too complicated, but here there is a miracle that happens uh, that, um, so, well, I, if it did not happen, I don't know what you would do. And it's the fact that you have a good vector field, which, uh, at least the way I understand it, allows you to control x times v in L2, which is something much stronger than uh, an L1 information on your data, which is morally where the perturbative theory should stop. So here you need something else, and it's some structure in the nonlinearity that allows you to get control to uh, this, this thing. So uh, back to the equation. Ah, uh, well. well, what I said is, is more about the fact that you can put x times v in the in the strong norm. Um, okay, it's probably also related to the fact that you get a better inequality for v hat for the weak norm, but uh, not in a way that I understand well. So I'm going to show you a uh, very pedestrian way to control the weak norm. Uh, you can, after that, try to optimize it, make it nicer and nicer, but I like it because it's really the point of view of trying to find a small uh, dent in the armor and then turning the crank to get better and better and better estimates until the point that you get what you want. So, uh, we had our equation, which was written, well, which I have erased, but if you remember, it was this equation, this equation, and if you look at it in the Fourier space, it gives you precisely that. All right, and somehow out of this, we want to extract the ODE that we think is uh, the one driving uh, the, uh, the, the v hat. Okay, and so what can we, uh, what can we get? 
Well, and so what can we get? Formally, we if we could do the stationary phase analysis, we would be done because this is the phase. The critical point, they correspond to eta equals sigma equals zero, and they, would, they are exactly uh, the one that are going to give us the ODE. Now, the problem, of course, is that we don't have that much regularity on uh, our function, and so we need to, um, well, to still uh, be able to extract the, the, the phase. And so what we're going to do is to, well, whenever it's a problem about regularity, we want to introduce the little wood pele um, projectors, but this time uh, for v hat, so they will correspond more to localization in space. So uh, decompose v as to v close to the origin plus v far from the origin. And um, well, where I will ask you to bear with me is that close and far are going to mean different things at different time, uh, but there will always be expressed in terms of one parameter that I'll call capital R. And so, uh, so let me write it this way. And so it is just, um, so something that is one, uh, well, okay, let me write it. and chi is like this. Whereas uh, whenever we were talking about frequency, uh, in the frequency we were more choosing our little wood payday to be between one and two. Now we want the one that starts at zero. Um, okay, and so if you just think a bit about the formula for the stationary phase, what we want to do is to localize at uh, something that, that would be one over the square root of uh, the big parameter lambda. And so, and this we can do so long as our input are uh, regular. And so that would be, so and uh, if you do the computation, that would correspond to r about root t. Uh, so, and let's be, so here is, for example, where you could tweak it a bit. Now let's be ambitious and a little bit too much to begin with and choose. And now there is another parameter, uh, small parameter epsilon that doesn't depend on anything and that I'll choose to be very small. And for the moment, let's hope that we can really get almost to the scale of the stationary phase analysis. And well, look at this, which as we have said is this thing, f of v, v, v. And now, in the input, we decompose all of those v's into the one close to the origin, the one far to the o the one far from the origin. So all in all, we have uh, two times two times two choices, and um, and the hope is that most of the cases, whenever we have this, it's going to lead to a small contribution, and let's see why. And so now let me. Assume that I have three independent inputs because it could be either the one close to the origin or the one far from the origin. And I can see that this thing, well, if I wanted to bound it brutally, I could do a Cauchy Schwartz in two guys and estimate them in L2, and then the last one estimate it, well, in L1, I don't have that much choice. So I could have V. And then, ah, uh, no, so, ah, uh, uh, tau of A, tau of B, tau of C, in L1. And by that, I just mean that I can choose the, the one that I want uh, to estimate them either in L2 or in L1. And now let us see if I have two guys that are far away from the origin, then I'm done. Because those are the ones that I'm going to estimate in L2. Uh, up. Oh, 
or maybe up. Right, and if R is bigger than the uh, correct scale, then, um, and if I have two of them, then I get a, I get a term like that. Okay, so now, out of my three inputs, I can assume that at least two of them are almost at the right scale. And once you are there, then you know that it's going to work. You it's just a matter of being patient enough. So now I can assume if we only had one at the right scale, then it would be you would have to be more careful. Now can I assume, let's say that uh, a and b a equal uh, well, okay, that the first two inputs are uh, uh, close to the origin. And what, I'm, what that means is that those two guys are essentially smooth. So now I can start to use my stationary phase uh, kind of formula and then restrict to the case where the, uh, the phase is going to be stationary. So what does that mean? Well, if I assume that the first two are smooth, then I can integrate by part in uh, eta. So gradient in eta. And the gradient in eta is what is t sigma. So decompose i into the stationary and the non-stationary where the stationary part um, is what we have, but I only restrict, I guess it's a chi now, to a neighborhood of uh, the stationary point. So where this phase plus two epsilon, uh, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and then I have the same one. A hat of C minus eta, B hat C minus eta minus sigma, C hat of C minus sigma, B eta B sigma. And then the non-stationary part is wherever I am far away from the stationary point. Now, what can I observe? Well, this integral is arbitrarily small. Why? Because each time I integrate by part in eta, I'm going to gain, so the worst case is, uh, I'm going to gain one over sigma t, and the worst case is, well, actually, the derivative is going to fall in one of those guys, and I'm going to, um, okay. Uh, and let's say now two is smaller than, so now I know that their frequency are at most t to the uh, one half and I can do that n times and there is nothing that prevents me from iterating it. So, so long as I, I have any little gain, then uh, I manage to make this arbitrarily small. So, and so now I can gain 10 times and can put all of the guys in the strong norm. Okay, so the point is that we can forget about this, and now we can do all of the work that we had done before on this uh, new i instead of the previous one. And now we just do another iteration. Um, so I can do it here, but you will see it's exactly the same steps, except that we try to use more and more the smallness of the support that we get 
on the Fourier variable uh, to uh, force our input to be smoother and smoother. Now iterate because I stat of A, B, C. So what, I have, what have I gained? I've uh, forced uh, sigma to be pretty small. So now what I'm going to do is, uh, is, and I know that those two guys are already about as smooth as I want, and I would like this one to be smoother. So now uh, this time I will estimate this guy in L2 and this guy in L2. And then I have phi to the t to the one half plus epsilon sigma in L2. And so the point is that this, this doesn't give me anything. And this gives me a t to the minus one quarter. Um, yeah. And so now this one, I know that, uh, so if c is bigger than t to the three quarter, c, then, uh, okay. So now I forced I only knew that those two guys were as smooth as I wanted, and now I can force the third one to be a little smoother. Not smoother as much as I would like it, but a little smoother. And then we gain. Uh, so now we can assume And so why is it good that the last one is a little smoother? Because the last one was the one preventing me from doing using the other gradient, which was uh, the same thing as integrating by part in sigma. Now, when I integrate by part in sigma, I lose, I gain a t, and I lose a derivative. But the moment my derivative uh, uh, forces me to pay less than t, then I'm in business. I can restrict a bit. And so, um, so now I start is going to be I start two plus I start one plus I start two, and then so I always have the same phase. I have this one, which is sigma. And now I can restrict, but if you do the counting, so when I integrate by part, I gain a t times sigma. And then, uh, but uh, if the derivative falls on the rougher uh, input, I lose up to the t to the three quarter. So I can only, I have to force, I can only make sure that sigma uh, is uh, smaller than t to the one quarter. Or that the gradient is of this size. Times a hat c minus eta, b hat c minus eta minus sigma, c hat c minus sigma, d eta d sigma. Uh, and then i stat 2 is the same thing, but um, so these are chi is in my notation, 1 minus chi of this. And again, for the, the one which is non-stationary in the other variable, I can integrate by part as many times as I want. Each time I gain a t to the small power, but since I can iterate it as many times, I can now just forget about that one. And maybe I won't, uh, I'll just do it orally. Um, so now we've started to restrict everything. We would like to uh, continue gaining a bit. So we're going to have to estimate all of these uh, in L infinity, so as to be able to use the full size of the support. 
And so you see that uh, if we estimate those two guys in L infinity, we're going to gain uh, t to the minus one half just by integrating in sigma. And uh, we're going to gain a bit by integrating in uh, eta. And so the moment c gains me more than t to the one half, then I'm in business. So now just by looking at this formula, here I can force one half plus. Um, and now I can improve on the integration by part to get all the way to this uh, size. Now there is some exercise that I will let you do yourself is that you can't really improve on that. Or the only place where you could improve is by removing the one half. And why is that? Because when you uh, continue to integrate by part, this time the worst case is going to be when the derivative hits the cutoff, the localization factor, and there you lose more than you gain. But at least we can get to one half plus, and, uh, and at this stage uh, you've won because um, so, and then you can force because again by doing the same computation you put one of them in L1, the other one in L2. You, s you know that now all of them have to be smoother than what the stationary phase uh, would predict would. Uh, require, you can force a to be t to the one quarter a, b to be t to the one quarter b, and c to be t to the one quarter c. And in fact, so you have to lose a bit, but the point is that t to the one half was the, the cutoff for the stationary phase. The moment you can go below that, we'll see that um, it's enough to uh, understand this thing uh, completely. And so now let us extract the main dynamic. Now that inputs are smooth. And so, uh, once again, where you could have made this argument a lot more elegant was to not having to turn the crank many times by repeating the same operation, but uh, uh, finding better scales directly. But I thought it was better to do it this way because you see that it's the moment you start gaining a bit, then after that, uh, you know that it's going to work. And you gain little by little. Okay, so we are reduced to this case. I dt v hat of c t is equal to e to the 2 i sigma t. And we've gained something, but this is not going to be too important now. It's plus, plus, sigma. But where we've gained a lot is the fact that uh, our inputs, we can assume that they are smooth in the sense that if I uh, take a derivative of them, I get something that is t to the one quarter times itself. And so, well, now what I would like to do to see something better is to just rescale my variable to make this phase uh, of size of about one. So let's um, say what, well, okay, eta, sigma, I won't change their name, but they go to one over root t, eta, one over root t, sigma. And then, it's easy to see that. And so, why is it interesting? Because this is the scale where these phase start to matter, but now it's going to force, uh, to force eta, to replace eta by eta over root t. And you see that now here, here, and there, all of the, everything but the xi is going to become very small, and so we'll be able to extract. And so this is going to depend essentially on xi, especially that v hat is smooth now. So I have the Jacobian, one over t, two i eta sigma, and now the t has been absorbed. Phi, and now I have t to the minus one half plus eta 
g to the minus one half sigma plus v hat of c minus eta over root t, v hat of c minus eta plus sigma over root t, v hat of c minus sigma over root t, v eta v sigma. And once you see this, then it's going to be good because we already have the uh, main decay. So uh, we'll the, the main term is not never going to decay better than that. We've already identified it. And the moment we gain anything, we get to something which is better than, uh, which has better than 1 over t decay. And so that will be integrable. So in particular, we can see um, <laughs> v hat of xi minus e, v hat of root t minus v hat of xi is going to be smaller than, well, the difference, eta over root t, times uh, the derivative times dx v hat. But then this is at most t to the 1 quarter divided by 1 over root t. So it's still going to be like t to the minus 1 quarter. So in all of this times, let's say the strongest norm of V. But so in all of this, I could replace, I can pull out uh, this argument. And now I get 1 over t. I get V hat of C t squared V hat of C t. And then times e to i eta sigma v t to the minus one half eta or chi. V eta d sigma plus and now you could still be a little um, worried that here we're integrating on something better, bigger and bigger. But in fact, you see that uh, at the limit, this I could replace this by 1. And then I just have the integral of the direct mass. And so this, if you count this, is equal to pi plus something that decays a little bit. And so at the limit, uh, I get exactly the dynamic. And uh, the most important case is that now, and I'll finish here. And now, v by dt of v hat of xt squared is two real part. And here you see that it's important that I have, uh, a, well, I, either a conservation law, but at least a consolation for the limit system of v, or I guess it's two imaginary part of v hat of xi t times dt of v hat of xi t. And the point is that this guy disappears and I only get the remainder. And so, well, after that, it's essentially straightforward to uh, finish the proof. And if you go on r cross t2, um, well, the problem that, uh, so essentially this computation informs the norm that you're going to be able to remain under control, the weak norm. And the problem that you get is that um, it uh, starts to control very little, so you can't really, so you have to refine uh, a lot the previous argument. And one last comment I'll do is that uh, when you get to uh, controlling HS uh, with S smaller than one, then you don't have any conservation low uh, for the HS norm for your uh, resonance system. And this is why uh, I didn't give you uh, something about the control of all of the solution to the NLS, because the only thing that we can do is construct one solution whose HS norm grows, but such that there is one Sobolev norm a little lower that remains uniformly bounded, so that even if we don't have this argument for free, we have it for the solution that we are trying to uh, get as asymptotic behavior. And so, well, this requires a, bit of, uh, a little bit of work, but uh, you can do it. 
All right, so I, in the end, I, won't, I didn't tell too much about the Arcross T case, but uh, at least I hope this gives you a uh, nice um, overview of uh, questions related to the cubic analysis. So thank you very much for uh, <laughs> listening patiently. Okay. So in your scattering results, um, is the convergence only in L2 but not in like H H1 or your weighted spaces? Um, well, so no, not in the not in the strongest norm. O only in L2. Well, in anything that interpolates between the two, okay. because you have some like the difference decays, you have the okay. the top norm that grows arbitrarily slowly, and by interpolation, things in the middle are going to converge. So. But it is true that it's not completely satisfactory in the sense that the assumption that you get on the initial data, um, well, you don't have scattering in that norm. But in some sense, uh, you know that uh, you, don't, you won't get uniform control of your solution in the strongest norm, because it's just not true for the resonance system. OK, thank you. Uh, other questions for the moment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let's find the speaker again.